if we weren't going to found, this is what we'll be asking, if we weren't going to found a state where the principles of Islam would be fully established and put into place, then why did we need a new country in the first place? And this is sort of his, it's, it's, a, it's a profound question if you think about it. And it's a question that in many different ways uh, Pakistan has been wrestling with. And so you go back to the sort of, you know, you go back to the start of this narrative, and in 1949 then, just two years after independence, Pakistan passed this something called the Objectives Resolution, which is where, where the state clearly says that it will, it's, it's a job of Pakistan to make the fulfillment of Islam in people's lives possible. And very soon after that, you sort of have a lot of the religious minorities start leaving. Most of them, of course, move, move across the border to India. And the, a, a place which in 1947 would have been roughly between 20 to 25 percent of the population of what is now Pakistan would have been Hindus and Sikhs and, and Christians and gradually becomes almost 100 percent of one faith because people feel this kind of, that they're not welcome anymore. This is a state that is, that, that is implementing the objective resolution. That's the kind of overarching picture. But in reality, <coughs> life was not that different for most people because the people who founded the state, the people who followed Jinnah, were broadly westernized, liberal, secular people. And so they had a political argument about whether or not they wanted to be in a country with, other pe with people of another faith. But among their, in, 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 in organizing their own lives, uh, it was a sort of very easygoing secular place. And if you sort of go back and read the accounts of Karachi, for example, in the 1950s and 60s, um, Karachi was probably, I'd say, in, in, in 1965, in some ways, a more cosmopolitan, more westernized city uh, than any city in India, uh, including perhaps Mumbai. Maybe that's sort of debatable. But it was a sort of, you know, there were nightclubs. They had singers coming from all from, 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 from Lebanon and from other places. Uh, alcohol free, flowing freely and so on. So, so but, the, but the real changes then start occurring, oddly enough, not under Zia, but just before Amanda Bhutto. And this is extremely ironic because Ulfikar Ali Bhutto was elected in 1970. And he himself, again, came from the secular class. He was a landed feudal. He sort of, you know, owned thousands, of, so the family owned thousands of acres of land. And you know the, the old joke in Pakistani politics used to be when, 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 when his children were fighting, Benazir Bhutto and Murtaza Bhutto were fighting over who would get, who would claim Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's legacy, and the joke used to be that they're really not fighting for who's going to be the prime minister, they're fighting for who's going to control the great Bhutto estates because the prime ministership is almost like a little add-on compared to the power of controlling that 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 amount of land, so. Bhutto gets elected in 1970, and he's a, he's a curious figure because in his personal life, again, this is the person who is extremely, uh, at least sort of barely praised, is uh, known to drink like a fish, is, uh, it, it, it has a sort of somewhat loose lifestyle, very elite. But uh, he decides that politically it makes sense for him to make overtures to radical Islamist thought. And the single most important thing starts happening in the early 70s. He does things that at that time, if you look, if you if you look at it at the time, seem like they're very small cosmetic concessions. So what are the kinds of things that Bhutto did in the early 1970s? At that time, of course, the Islamists were very marginal. And so what Bhutto does, does is things like he, he banned alcohol and gambling. <laughs> That's one of the first things he did. And under pressure, he said, no, no, no more alcohol in Pakistan, because this is an Islamic country. No more gambling. So the casinos and the bars get shot, etc. But you actually said that he drinks a lot. Uh, in his own home. He doesn't need to go to a bar for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, come, I mean, to be fair, I mean, you, you have, Democracy in politics is not confined to, <laughs> to, to any one place. No, no country has a monopoly on that. Um, 
he then replaced the Sunday holiday with the Friday because oh. he's like, well, we don't need to have, we don't need, to, the, the, we don't need to take a day off on Sunday, which was sort of. And then the most important thing is he he, he declared the tiny Ahmadiyya sect, which is a kind of it's a marginal, very small, but highly educated uh, subsect of Islam. He declared them to be un-Islamic, and oh. this really in, in this happened in 1973. This was really the turning point where, for the first time, an idea where Jinnah and Maududi would have been on completely opposite sides. You see Maududi's idea winning. Maududi was still alive then. And the, the, the nub of this, without getting into deep into theology, the nub of the problem that Maududi and the radicals had with the Ahmadiyyas is that the Ahmadis call themselves Muslim, regard themselves as Muslim, venerate the Prophet Muhammad, read the Quran, all of that. But what they say is that the person who founded their religion in the 19th century, who was Mirza, his name is Mirza Ahmed, they say that he had a revelation. And the revelation led him to found this religion. He, he didn't call it a different religion, but he said that he had a revelation directly from God. And that, according to the Islamists, is an extreme, is, is is, is simply not allowable, and that makes them non-Muslim. And so Maududi started agitating against the Ahmadis in the 1950s. In the 1950s, there was a powerful Pakistani minister called Zafarullah Khan, who was, a, who was an Ahmadi, and so they started this agitation against him then. A few people died, Maududi was arrested, but then the government caught cold feet, and they didn't sort of carry through, and he was released. But what happened then was they sort of that was the first act on this sort of play, which was should the Ahmadis be allowed to call themselves Muslim or not? And all the way until the 1970s, Pakistan said, of course they can. They call them. The, we don't, we don't sort of play this game of deciding who can call themselves a Muslim and who can't. But in the 70s, then Bhutto in 1973 changed this, and it seemed like a small thing if you think about it, because what percentage of them? I mean, it, it, it's a tiny percentage of the population, maybe one percent of the population or less. But in principle, he had given in to this idea, and the Ahmadis were they were no longer allowed to call themselves Muslim. They had to sort of sign a special waiver saying and and and, and have a special thing in their passport saying that they weren't Muslim and so on. So that's the kind of these are the, the, the two or three things that that Bhutto did not thinking that the country would become a fundamentalist country, but just thinking that this is smart politics, you can co-opt some of your opponents, <coughs> and so on. So that's what you but the real <coughs> kind of you know, uh, heyday of, of Islamization starts under General Zia. Mm -hmm. And General Zia took power in a coup in 1977. And he was very, very different from Bhutto in the sense that Zia, was him Zia himself truly believed in these ideas. He was a sympathizer of the jamaat e islami and Maududi's ideas. So he himself believed in these ideas, whereas with Bhutto, he didn't believe in the ideas, but he was willing to implement them for short-term political gain. And 